Yeah, slam dunk, right? This is classic, classic myxoid liposarcoma. And I just made a really long video recently about everything that you could want to know pretty much about the basics of liposarcomas. But, um, and you can refer to that if you want to have a real in-depth discussion. A few things that help. They are hypocellular with a myxoid background. The one thing that I think is really helpful in telling it apart from a lot of other myxoid tumors is note that the cells are spread apart and do not touch each other. They like respect, they have good social distancing. Ooh, I just thought of that now. I've, that, I haven't thought of that since COVID started and that's a great thing. Um, they, have a, they have a very large personal space bubble, okay? And they're, they're good social distancers. They stay away from their neighbors and, and usually very few of them overlap. They do not form cords and chains. So unlike some of the other myxoid stuff we talked about, which have cords and chains and connected cells, you don't see connected cells usually in regular conventional myxoid liposarcoma. You see these little cells, they are also very bland. Again, a translocation sarcoma, right? So these cells have a translocation. Fus DDIT3 used to be called Fus CHOP, was the most common one. Occasionally a subset of them, like 5% or so, will have EWS R1, Ewing's gene, rearranged with DDIT3. And so if you haven't learned yet that a lot of times if, if there's a rearrangement of EWS R1 with some other gene, eventually someone's gonna find cases that have Fus rearranged with that same gene and vice versa because FUS and EWSR1 are similar genes, the kind of same gene family, which again, this is way over my head. I'm not a molecular pathologist, but the point is, is they, they often swap out for one another. So um, that's a good, a good take home to remember. So the uh, cells are very bland though. You do not see pleomorphism in this tumor with the rare, rare exception that has been described in children of pleomorphic myxoid liposarcoma, which even though it's in the books, I, a, I've never seen one, and B, the concept does not sit well with me because my understanding is they behave different than regular myxoid liposarc, they're more aggressive. A lot of them do not have DDIT3 gene arrangement, so I kind of think they're a different tumor than this, but I don't know, I'm not, I don't write the book, so I, maybe I don't have the right to say that, but in any case, the, uh, the general rule that you should take home is you, if you see pleomorphism, it's not myxoid liposarcoma with the rarest of exceptions maybe, okay? So the, the thing is, is that by any rule, this tumor looks benign, right? The only way to recognize what this is, is the pattern. Cytologically, by mitotic activity, all the stuff we use to teach first year residents how to tell what cancer is, this doesn't look like cancer, right? It looks like a benign something. And I've seen people mistake this on a needle and call it myxoma or something else. So that happens sometimes. So the, the cells are bland, kind of oval, round to spindle, spaced out in a myxoid background. Lipoblasts do not have to be found, although usually you will see them. We're looking at them right here. They look different than the big pleomorphic lipoblasts you'd see and think of for like a pleomorphic liposarc. In mixer liposarcoma, you tend to get either little univaculated signet ring looking cells, or some of these guys are kind of bivaculated or multivaculated, but with a tiny little bland nucleus. They, they See, these are multi-bubbly cells, but they just are so little, right? So the idea here is that this tumor is kind of recapitulating what fetal fat looks like during fat development in the, the fetus. And if you see fetal fat, which I'm sure uh, our pediatric pathology colleague, again, Hung can, can speak to, that there are times in early fetal life where the fat can have some similarity to this, that fat in embryology, my basic understanding is starts out as a spindled like precursor to adipocytes, and then it builds up a little lipid and makes a vacuole and then can make more vacuoles sometimes, and then eventually grows into full mature fat cell. See there, there's multivaculated adipocyte uh, lipoblasts here. So sometimes you'll see them, but I've seen cases where they were very few or absent or where they were just like little signet ring cells. So don't go hunting for the, don't be worried if you don't find lipoblasts here, okay? And then the, finally, the vessels, which you probably all want to talk about. Let me go see if there's a better area that shows them really good. Maybe here. The vessels of myxoid liposarcoma are the smallest, most delicate vessel you could possibly make. They are like one endothelial cell thick, and that's it. They don't have a muscle wall around them. They are a single layer of endothelial cells. If you find ones with red cells in them, sometimes the red cells look like Rollo formation. There's like only room for one single, single file endothelial cells to go through the vessel. That's the way I like to think of them. So if you're seeing vessels that are branchy, but have a, like a muscle layer around them, a nice layer of pericytes, you know, obviously around the outside of the endothelium, that's not the vessel pattern that you look for in, in mixed with liposarcoma. You want these super delicate vessels that look like the, if you touch them, they just break open, right? Look at that. Look at those 
and the, the, those red cells in there. So, so tiny, right? So that pattern uh, that people call chicken wire, which um, uh, you might've heard, I don't really like that terminology because chicken wire, if you've ever seen it on a farm, is hexa repeating perfect hexagons of metal wire. There is no repeating perfect hexagon here. And again, this is my, my very concrete brain that's not good at abstract thoughts. Um, I, you know, I want um, chicken wire to be perfect hexagons. So to me, I like delicate branching vessels or maybe chicken feet vessels, chicken scratch vessels. I don't know. I've heard different terms, but in any case, these are the vessels of mixolipposarc. However you like to memorize them, this is what they look like, okay? And then here's an example of these kind of signet ring lipoblasts. And then uh, let's see. Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is this. See these pools of mixoid stuff? This happens in some cases of mixoid liposarcoma and has been likened to the kind of pattern of like what a lung with really bad pulmonary edema looks like. I got an autopsy lung that's filled with fluid and you have these big dilated spaces with this fine fluid in them. So this pulmonary edema-like pattern is a useful clue um, that comes up in some cases of mixoid liposarcoma. It's relatively uncommon these days to get a nice big piece of mixoid liposarcoma like this because now a lot of cases of sarcomas, big soft tissue masses are diagnosed by needle biopsy. And then um, after they get a needle, these are very sensitive to, to radiation and also sometimes to chemotherapy. And once they're treated, they just shrink down and become very sclerotic and they look almost like a welded if liposarc at that point. Oh, I will point out one thing. Um, I, when I was talking about the vessels, it doesn't mean you cannot have bigger vessels in the, the tumor. I mean, there has to be a feeder vessel. So you will see big vessels in the middle of mixoid liposarc, but those vessels are not the vessels that we're talking about. The, the, these vessels, you need, you need to have those really to make a good diagnosis of mixoid liposarc. Um, so if you've got branchy vessels that are thicker than that, that's not the kind of vessels. There are other tumors that have those branchy vessels. Oh yeah, sometimes you can get a variable size of mature adipocytes in a mixoid liposarcoma. So if you see mature fat there, that's totally fine. It happens sometimes. And then finally, what I point out is over here, something different is happening. So what's this? Cells are not really doing their social distancing well. They're st starting to get close and overlap. Yeah, very good. So this is what historically has been called round cell liposarcoma, which is basically like the high grade form of mixoid liposarc. There has been a recent trend against using this term. I still put it in parentheses when I make this diagnosis because people are familiar with it. But I think the WHO now says that when we see more than 5% of the tumor have um, a hypercellular kind of larger round cells that are packed close together, that we say it's got high, it's a high grade mixoid liposarcoma. So now that's what I'll say is high grade, open parentheses, quote, round cell, close parentheses, mixoid liposarcoma. Um, and so if you see um, necrosis or uh, more than 5% of the tumor with a round cell morphology, then that's when you make that diagnosis. On a needle, that's very problematic because often on a needle, you will have no idea if you're going to get that much. Although I've seen cases where very skilled um, musculoskeletally trained radiologists were able to find an area that looked more cellular and less fat or mixoid density and then put the needle in that area, which is really helpful. And that's why working with a really good radiologist is a lifesaver when you're a soft tissue pathologist. And then these, these tumor, these particular cells are very evacuated. And I've definitely seen that in some um, high grade round cell mixer liposarcs where there was very evacuated, prominent vacuoles. I've seen some that had brown fat, like I mentioned earlier. And um, the problem is it can be a little hard to tell, like how much is enough to call it round cell? Like, what about this? Is this round cell? No. At the periphery of the lobules in mixoid liposarcoma, the cellularity tends to get increased. This is totally normal to see at the edges of lobules. And what I learned in, in fellowship after asking Dr. Weiss this question many times is, if I thought, could it be round cell? The answer was probably no, it's probably not enough. So that's what I, I learned is in general back down if there's any doubt. But this area here, I mean, this is an area that the whole, the whole thing doesn't look like normal mixoid liposarc anymore. It may not be a, sometimes it can be like solid sheets that look almost like Ewing sarcoma or like a poorly differentiated round cell synovial sarcoma. This one is not doing that. This has still got some mixoid background, but the cells are way too cellular to me. And I think are enough to, to make the criteria. And I've had occasional times on a needle where I said, there's a little increased cellularity. I don't know if it's enough to be round cell or not. The problem is, is if they pre-treat with radiation, a lot of the stuff melts away, including the round cell. So the excision specimen, there's no way to really know. It's not like there's any real major difference, though. It's not like we have some special therapy to offer. The treatment's going to be probably the same, although I've seen times where they decided to 
only give radiation on a regular mixoid liposarc, and then it, when it was a high grade and you know, had round cell, they were debating whether they should add chemo plus. So I've seen times where it, it was taken into account, but there's not like a solid definitive um, treatment plan difference in the literature to my knowledge, although um, I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not an oncologist, so there may be a lot of nuance beyond what I understand. So I just think a main important morphology is recognize those cellular areas that look round blue like, but even when they're there, usually you'll still find the delicate vessels in the background and usually there'll, there'll still be some component of mixoid material in between the tumor cells. So keep that in your round blue cell differential, although the, only rarely have I seen it where a whole core was all round blue cells. I have seen that, but it's very rare. Usually there's mixoid areas present. So any questions? Hmm. No one has yet, um, but I, I think the only thing that really matters is, you know, if it's more than 5%. And the general rule is if it's on a needle, if I see stuff that's definitively round cell, then it, it doesn't really matter to me. At that point, the possibility of the tumor having less than 5% and the needle magically hitting the 2% area, that seems very unlikely to me. So I usually, if it's on a needle at all, I report it. On an excision, it's just so rare for me to get a full excision. Like, I can't remember where I got this slide. I think I might have got this from an old study set, actually. I don't I don't think this was a case I signed out in practice. So I, I don't know if I can remember actually seeing a full excision where I had obvious round cell and could even give a percentage. So um, in general, I like to avoid giving actual percentages on stuff unless I'm forced to because I don't feel like I'm very good at estimating it, um, which is part of why I like derm path and soft tissue and not other parts of it. Of pathology where you have to ca calculate percent of key I key 67 staining and stuff so anyway um i don't know if that's a good answer but it's an honest one yeah so the, the question brought up is that if post treatment once these tumors have been radiated they usually the vast majority of them just completely get wiped out and all that's left is sclerotic collagen a little bit of the vascular branchy stuff and um, mature adipocytes with occasional little tiny lipoblasts, maybe a few pockets of mixoid change. And if there was a round cell component, you'll never know because it usually gets wiped out and blasted by the radiation. So I agree, that's the problem. The trade-off is that doing the needle ahead of time to get the diagnosis on a needle biopsy allows you to make a diagnosis and pre-treat the tumor. The trade-off though is that on the excision specimen, you'll really never probably know what the original morphology was like. And I feel like this is one of the trade-offs we've made in modern medicine where there are benefits of having a needle biopsy before excision, a lot of benefits and probably more benefits than risks, but there are some downsides and that's one of them is pretreatment wipes out the original morphology. But again, it's the main difference is the prognosis. The long-term prognosis is worse, unfortunately, for patients that have high grade round cell morphology. Um, and even though the low grade mixoid liposarcs in the past, there was a thought that like, you know, 90% of the patients were, were gonna be okay and 10% would get METs. But I think with longer follow-up, we started to see that a significantly larger number, actually, even of people with low-grade conventional mixoid liposarcoma will get metastases. I think the WHO says, I think their current quote is between 30 and it's more than 30%, I think. Um, and different studies show different things so that even it just sometimes it's longer and farther out. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention the other weird thing that you should know about mixoid liposarc, like all sarcomas, it will metastasize the lungs oftentimes. But it also metastasizes to very strange places. In addition to the lung, they can go to other soft tissue sites. Like I've heard of them going from one thigh to another thigh, or from which is bizarre. How does that happen? It doesn't make sense. Or going to other soft tissue sites elsewhere in the body. I've um, I've seen cases metastasize to lung and also to the pleura or the pericardium, like outside the heart. And the other place that they really like to go to a lot is bone, particularly the spine. So it's, a, it's not a bad idea to consider whether, you know, maybe they should have imaging of the spine. I've, I've had that discussion actually recently with the, one of the, the oncologists I know who does sarcoma. And I don't think there's really proven literature there, but it may not be a bad idea actually to get, just like we get a baseline chest CT for patients with sarcomas. For people with this type of sarcoma, I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to get a spine, you know, CT just to make sure that there's, you know, people have lots of little degenerative changes in their spine. And then at follow-up, sometimes it's hard to know if there's a little mass somewhere. Is that a tumor that's met or is it a pre-existing lesion? And I see that come up in, our, in sarcoma tumor boards again and again. So having that baseline imaging might not be a bad idea. That's just a recent conversation I had with a, an oncologist. Um, so I don't know if that's a proven thing yet, but I, I actually like that, that reasoning. I thought that was a very good idea.
So I learned so much from doing tumor boards with my um, my uh, treating physician colleagues and radiologists in, in bone and soft tissue. That is just priceless to have colleagues that know about this stuff. The thigh is by far the most common site. The deep muscle of the thigh of a middle age or young adult. Um, that's important. I guess I should have said that at the beginning. Also, it's very rare for kids to get liposarcom uh, liposarcomas of any sort, but when they do, the type they get almost always is myxoid liposarcoma, and uh, that's a diagnosis that I want to have molecular confirmation on for sure, um, to, have, to be sure of. And the other thing is that in a kid, if you see something that you think looks like myxoid liposarcoma, the first thing you should think of is lipoblastoma, which can have a very close overlap morphologically and look very similar to this. There are some differences, but it's very similar and I feel like if I've got any doubt, I want to do fish to be sure because the difference is totally benign versus malignant and a big difference for the kid. And it's real easy to solve with molecular. So um, I've had times where I've done that and that, is, that molecular has been very helpful in those cases.